I be kicking it with cools. 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 Got a lot of shit to lose. I be kicking it with cools. 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 How'd I end up on the news? I'm good. I feel like this has been like a long time coming. We've had this plan for a while. I feel like this has been already written. Yeah, right? 2012. Joey Badass. Yeah. Flatbush Zombies. That was a good show. Yeah, it's full circle because, and uh, you know, going back to the, we'll get back, we'll get to it, but uh, you know, the whole approval of the record thing mm -hmm. that we was having a conversation about behind the scenes, like that was a show where not only did I have to perform, and you know, it was kind of like a contest, mm -hmm. and not only did you have to be, you had to compete, but you had to send a record to, uh, at the time, it was a. Uh, Cinematic music group, yeah, and um, they would approve of it. And not only did boys win that, but they also approved. And I did like a record that was like styled kind of like uh, what's that song called? Uh, with CJ Fly, was it Hard Knock? Hard, I think it is on the 1999, yep. yeah. So, full circle because now obviously we'll get into it, but yeah, welcome to Kicking It. I'm Cooj, and this is the Ty Cooper Show. AKA messy three times. AKA if you don't say it three times, don't say it at all. Let's get let's get into the name change. How we get there? Let's start with that. Formerly mm -hmm. known as Messy Ty, yes. now known as the Ty Cooper Show. Yeah, people still be calling me Messy too, and I'm cool with it because they be like, "Oh, uh, my fault, Messy." Uh, I understand, like, but and I be like, "Yo, my first name's Ty, so it's okay." Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it, it came it came about uh, last year. Uh, I came into the position where I was changing a label, changing management, and I came across an individual named Dan Murphy, mm -hmm. uh, Silent Reminder Entertainment is the name of the record label, and when Dan made the transition from being in the banking industry into being in the entertainment industry, he made a proposal to bring me on board as, you know, the first artist to be signed to Silent Reminder, and it was, for me, a new leaf to turn over. Mm -hmm. And I already been plotting ten years ago, when I was in high school, going by Messy Ty, that there was gonna be a time where I was gonna go by just Ty, or maybe Ty Cooper, as like you know Kendrick Lamar, Joel Ortiz. Yeah. I always appreciated the uh, you know Kanye West. I always appreciate artists that have their first and last name in their as their stage name, and I knew that transition would come, but I didn't think that the foundation that I laid down as Messy Ty would translate to being, you know. Ty Cooper because it wasn't hard to make the, the transition because it like the foundation was already laid out for sure so people was able to accept the name change as well as you know the new found you know success label do you feel like with the new name uh, brings you this new confidence especially with the new sound that you that you have with this new newest project Say that one more time. Would you say with like you changing your name, like you've like found a new style, found like kind of a new confidence too? Because I feel like the music sounds different too, like in a good way, like it's matured. Uh yeah, I feel as though that I evolved as a person. Mm -hmm. I've always been Ty Cooper. My main thing being uh, abbreviated as Messy Ty the entire time was no matter how people know you as Mess, no matter how many people know you as Messy, you're still Ty Cooper. Mm -hmm. Uh, I like to do a lot of self-reflections and over the years I always you know I always put I was always hard on myself about like people uh, I want people to know Ty Cooper you know what I'm saying how, do, how can we get Ty to be a household name and at the same time the music and the way of the music was being put together it never changed it was just the name change and then yeah like the music definitely evolved as the name change and, like came about and now it's like full circle because now I'm actually just being myself, which is who I was the entire time. I felt with that. Hell yeah. Would you like some? Yeah, hell yeah. Can you tell us about all these bottles on this table? Well, I love brand ambassador type vibes. I mean, I, I have some cool friends online that um that are into that industry. Mm -hmm. uh, Rick Ross is a, you know... Cheers. Oh, thank you. Cheers, my brother. Thank you. Um, Rick Ross is a great uh, example for uh, a brother who understands hustling and being able to like network with other people and brand like brands. I always been the, I always been the type of uh, artist and just brand myself where if I come across a brand 
that I can express that, you know, that expresses me. Self-made taste is better. That happens to be the catchphrase for Luke Belair. Mm -hmm. um, shout out to Brett Barish. Um, to me, I always been self-made and just the whole meaning of being self-made and, you know, seeing the bottle and the lifestyle of, you know, sharing the bottle with your friends and your, uh, you know, your, your peers and shit like that shit really like put me on game to want to express the bottle as if I was already endorsed by them. Mm -hmm. So as I've been doing, I was doing that since like 2016, 2015. And after a while, I started growing and seeing how like Rick Ross would get, you know, connected with other brands. And he would even drop jewels as if he was talking to me like, yo, get behind these brands and just rep. You know, Ethica is another brand I, I associate myself with and would like to continue and also have some type of foundation with partnership wise in the near future. Um, you know, just brands that happen to have an open lane to for you to embrace them and they're willing to embrace you back too. So, you know, I feel like I've been embraced by Bel Air over the years. I've been, you know, I've also felt embraced by others when they come across Bel Air because there was people that wasn't drinking Bel Air or didn't know about Bel Air in Rhode Island until I was drinking it and promoting mm -hmm. it like I was behind it the whole time. So that's just my appreciation to the brands that have a, 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 a window and opportunity for you to grow with them as well. Mason number nine wine is uh, a wine that I came across from uh, Post Malone. Mm -hmm. And Drink Marcel is came about on behalf of this brother named Nick Storm, like who's also my publicist. Okay. So, yeah, I'm just embracing the, you know, liquor and you know the wine and spirit in industry. So yeah, it's been cool, and they've been showing love back. So that's why it really matters. Not nah, really all that matters. And mm -hmm. this is fucking great, by yeah. the way. <laughs> this is really good. Have y'all tried Bel Air? Yeah, sure, it's just good. Yeah, it's a, there's a, there's a new flavor on the market. It's called Blue. Um, you know Young Blue? Yeah. I haven't had it. That. Yeah, it's cool. I need to try it. Like Young Blue's behind it. Gucci, that's Gucci. Like, what I love about Brett Barish, he gets artists to be the new face of whatever uh, new limited edition Bel Air product that comes out. Like the Pink Rosé, mm -hmm. that was like Young Thug. Makes sense. He had Young Thug behind, like, showed love to Young Thug on that one. I think um, King Vaughn as well. Um, Cowboys, rest yeah, rest in peace to uh, King Kong. But uh, yeah, shout out to Brett Barry, shout out to Bumble Rum, shout out to Vion, uh, Drink Control. That's a healthy nutritional uh, transition where if you want to get you, if you want to get your hands on something like uh, a smoothie or a, it's like the bottom of the cereal box. Okay. The bottom of the cereal box is what you taste when you drink Control. Huh. Yo, you gonna get all the all the like brand ambassador yeah. around here. Rap snacks. Shout out to James Lindsay because at some point I would love to have my own face Yo, rap snacks on a rap so snack. Good. They're so good. Yeah. Have you tried the Cardi B rap snacks? No, I I had the Biggie. Biggie ones are good. Yeah. The Migos ones are good, but the Cardi B ones are like out of this world. Rap wow. snacks are fire. We got it. We got it. They they don't have it in our economy, but that's why I would like to tap in and you know get more in depth with James and all the good folks at Rap Snacks so that we can have that out here. Not for sure. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier that you switched labels. You mentioned Dan. Talk about that relationship and how much that like has helped being a part of Silent. Um, it helped by... It, ha it helped me become more structured. Mm -hmm. You know, focused on if I really want to travel, if I really want to put out a project. Because what I was doing before was I would you know, bury myself in the studio by myself and just record myself and just listen to records and stockpile them, keep them in the vault and still to this day I just be like in amazement that I still have all the like access and all the records that's safely still in that vault. Um, it just helped me embrace what I was already doing, just, you know, working with the pen and whether I was writing music or writing down music, it didn't slow nothing down. Mm -hmm. You know, there's days where I don't want to write music on my phone and I'll just pick up my pad because it just brings me back to the element of like fourth grade, third grade, just scribbling, trying to just make words rhyme, not even caring if like, there's like a structure or like a, sense, yeah. if there's a format behind it. Like I just cared about the rhymes. Like Mace 
was like one of my favorite rappers for that. Like he just always rhymed, but like he made sense. So as a kid, I used to like envy him because I'm like everything he's saying makes sense, and it just like it's not hella like it's not like 2K fire emoji under your feet fire bars, but it's but like it's connected. It's good enough, it's yeah. Connecting. So yeah, man, just uh, making making my weights from being in one place like crew and then silent reminder. It just helped me just become more serious about my product, like craft it at that, like waking up every step, like waking up every morning and just doing 15 minute drills, just right. And it don't have to be about anything, just whatever it comes to mind and try to make it make sense without taking too much time. Like I set a timer and just, that's how I get busy every morning. Nah, I can fuck with that. Yeah. And it's, it, you seem very locked in ever since like you've, you've announced that like being with the label and mm -hmm. like seeing you, seeing you out and about, you're very locked in and Dan seems to be very locked in about you. So definitely love the relationship. Yeah, it's helped because like there's a, Dan is like a recovering perfectionist. <laughs> so like he happens to like enlighten me about shit that I'm already on myself about, but it's so dope. Cause I'd be like, yo, that's dope that like, he'll let me know like, yo, you got an interview. Set an alarm if you happen to be tired. Mm -hmm. You've been up at five o'clock in the morning. I like that type of, you know what I'm saying, like objective, like, cause that lets me know like, all right, someone takes me serious enough to take what I'm taking serious even more so. Yeah. Yeah, from what I remember, he's he's been like a fan of the music for a while, like way before you even signed. Right. Cause I met him at Bad Taste. Like four or five years ago, he was like, "Yo, do you know who Messy Tires?" I'm like, "That's the homie," and I was mad confused because, like, if you don't know who Bit Dan is, he's like, "You're like <laughs> this this middle aged looking white dude." Especially at the time, he was like super dressed, at, uh, working at a bank, and I'm like, "What the? F what do you want?" For <laughs> like, well, like, how do you know? How do you know who Dan Messy would, Tires? Dan would <laughs> wear a suit with fucking One. concrete fours or some shit. Yeah, <laughs> with some sneakers on, with some Jordans on, with like a rap tee under low key, just yeah. to make himself feel feel yeah. a little more comfortable. And that's. That's why that's hip hop. That's it's, and that's why I love Dan because of that connection. I understand and like, you know, I can talk to I can talk to Dan um, without trying to, you know, make a point or trying to like make it seem like I know hip hop. Because when I talk to Dan about Beastie Boys or like Ray Charles or Stevie Wonder or just anything on vinyl, like his choice of his choice of digging in the crates when it comes to vinyls mm -hmm. is very peculiar and interesting too. So. It's all. It all goes back to the shit that my mom was putting me onto, you know, sitting in the back seat, getting ready to go to school in the morning. Let's talk about how you got into rap, because you mentioned like writing rap raps third, fourth grade. Yeah. So how long have you been like rapping, and when did you realize that this is what I want to take seriously? I'll never forget when DMX said, "I've been doing this for 19 years. Niggas want to fight me, fight these tears." That's how long it's been. Wow. 2000. Well, 2001 would be 20, right? Yeah, thanks for 2021. Yeah. yeah, so 20 years ago, third grade, like I've been really, like really writing and taking it serious and hoping that I'll get better because it's like me rapping or getting getting to where I'm at with the you know with my craft. I kind of felt like what it what it feels like when you start off having dreads. Mm -hmm. It's like when you have like little dreads, people think like it's wild. Just, you look uh, no nah, like you, when you have short dreads. At least for me, when I had short dreads, I felt like I just looked ugly like. I felt like I looked just off, like it was just off-putting, like your dreads are just mad, they look like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, but, yeah, like, that shit, um, I'm sorry, I lost track of thought. No, you're good. I lost track of that. DMX, 20 years. DMX. So, yeah, man, DMX, um, Rough Riders, like, growing up, I had the chains, I was wearing No Limit gear, I was rocking G-Unit uh, clothing, and Rap City, the basement was on every every day. Like I remember my mom used to have me and my brothers uh, have a haircut every two weeks. Mm -hmm. We never miss having a haircut. She always have we always get our haircuts every two weeks and like every other week, sorry. And um Rap City the basement would be um sitting in the chair. I remember Uchi Wally. Wow. I remember Uchi Wally being on Rap City the Basement. What a time. And I'm just like, wow, I wish I was rapping. Like I remember horse's verse, hearing his verse as a kid I'm just like Yo, he was spazzing, like, and I'm just like, how did he say all that? And I'm, as a kid, just so interested in, like, I just really took that, that hunger and that, that fascination, like, that drive to just, like, want to get better. And, and, like I said, the ugly effect, I was not that good, but as I kept going, it was like my hair kept growing. Mm -hmm. It was like the, the, 
the volume of like the intensity of like really getting better with the craft like that shit got even better and then by like eighth ninth grade that's when I started like seeing a significant difference and I wasn't as good as I really wanted to be then mm -hmm. but then I'll say 11th 12th grade that's when I started really finding myself and then I have it like it was perfect for how I graduated because at 17 I came on the scene maybe like a little bit a year a little bit about a year after I graduated and from like 18 to like 21 I was locked in doing shows just on the ground feet on the ground type shit and that shit helped too so let's talk about the Ty Cooper actually like the show itself like seeing you perform live I feel like that's where you thrive the most I feel like the energy you line, bring yeah. you it, love the MTV unplugged vibes and if I mean, we'll, we'll probably get clips in here. That you practice in here all the time. Like how important is performing live to you? It seems like it's one of your favorite things to do. I feel like it's very important to an artist or to any person that happens to be active on stage, and you have something to present. You also like everything you do is a display. Whether you are selling something or you're actually proving that what you're displaying is worth them buying into. Mm -hmm. You know, so definitely feel like. So I just writing, having a space, whether it's like your room or just somewhere where you can actually envision performing in front of 10,000 people. Why do you want to perform in front of 10,000 people if you don't know how to, if you don't know how to walk back and forth across the stage without looking like you don't know what you're doing? You, you just want to present it in a way where people be like, just by his movement, just by her movement, you can tell she knows what the, she knows what she's doing. You can tell what he knows what he's doing. And I watched so many con concerts over the years, even before it was rap, like Janis Joplin and you know Jimi Hendrix at the Monterey. I was watching their movement, and then James Brown came along, and it's just that shift from being on one side of the stage to another side of the stage. I was always, you know, I was always curious about, all right, how do I do that and keep the same breathing pattern and keep my eyes pierced if I happen to want to. Lock, if I happen to want to lock eyes with someone, mm -hmm. how can I lock eyes with them and do whatever I'm planning to do on stage movement wise without fucking up? But also keeping that intensity locked in with, like, with that person, that one on one moment. How many times can I have one on one moments with everyone that's here? That's why it's amazing when if there's a show where there's not a lot of people, that's a good practice for when you're sitting here on stage in front of, you know, 11 people, 10 people, you can lock eyes. You have all the time in the world and the opportunity to lock eyes with someone. And just that connection you're making based off what you're saying, you can put so much emphasis on the performance part of it. That'll make someone a fan. Now, those the technicalities is really what makes this the little things that make you a, a, a performer. I know, I agree. I think, you know? and I, I'm glad that you touched on like those small shows that really that become practice because I think those are some of the most important shows like I think to this day I love I love doing smaller more intimate shows like I love the strand shows I love hosting at those things, but I love when it's like 15 20 people and it's a lot more intimate you get your practice in you kind of get to see you get to try new things to see what works what doesn't work I love also being on stage so I get I can fuck with it I've seen you perform countless of times and it's always really great and I remember my... you're one of your like the first show I remember when you first started hosting at The Strand, but that was before it was The Strand, right? It was Lupo's, yeah. Lupo's at the time. I, yeah, I think, it, I think I started maybe, I started, whenever Famous Dex came, it was still Lupo's. Yes. It became The Strand maybe like a year later. Because you was like, you was bouncing back from Lupo's to The Met. Mm-hmm. You know what and, I'm saying? Yeah, I was doing The Met every no, every so often, too. Yeah. Like with Spaka, shout out to Spaka. Yup, Spaka Summer. Um, I, yeah, like, I remember when you was just like, getting comfortable and getting in your bag and now you know I, i'm pretty sure you feel some type of like you know energy where you gotta just be on your p's and q's but i'm pretty sure it's also effortlessly at this point too right uh, i mean i still get nervous i still it's I, natural. St I, I still like get to the point where i'm just like fuck i don't think i'm gonna kill this tonight like i think my last few shows i was just kind of like overwhelmed because it had been such a long time but when you're up there and you kind of get that confidence, like when the confidence hits you, it, then that's when it becomes effortless. Once you kind of get through that awkward, what if they don't fuck with me today that thing, phase, you're yeah. good. Yeah. 
And I think that's my favorite part. Like once you kind of have the crowd in the palm of your hands, it's like, yo, this there's nothing better than that. And there's a lot of familiarity too. For sure. So now that there's people like seeing you do this, do this uh, location, and then do this location, you're not only meeting someone new in each location, but those same people are now starting to grow a stronger familiarity for you. And now all of a sudden, like when they see you out in the open or in public, they're like, yo, my nigga Cooge, what up? And you're just like, how the fuck you know me? Oh, you was at that show. Fact. Oh, he was like, yeah, you was hosting. I mean, I was that. I was like, oh, word. So it's always like dope to just be you, to be the best version of yourself in that moment because you never know. You know, four or five shows later, somebody that was at the first two is recapping to you about where you're at now because how you made them feel in the first two shows. And that's why it's important to kill it every time. Every just time. Kinda... So we being here locked and loaded. There'd be times we, you know, I'd be in here from like three o'clock till like nine o'clock mm -hmm. and I spend most of that time just sharpening the sword freestyling you know coming up with things hearing it on the voice notes uh, remembering what I'm saying and then jotting it down and just getting back into the show the show the performance tracks and that's why I love what Jada Kiss did and how he emphasized that whole you know artist you have to step your shit up because now that whole performing over vocal shit is dumb. Mm, that shit's killing it, man. That shit's like disgusting. Yeah. Like going to and like was, festivals and hearing that. Yo, I was so proud of them because of how they displayed, how they, you know what I'm saying? They commanded the room based mm -hmm. off their presentation. And the presentation really was just on some, you know, hip hop shit where you can like rap. When motherfucker, when, when who was it, Sugar Hill Gang? When Sugar Hill Gang was rapping that uh, Rapper's Delight live, they didn't have no fucking audio tracks playing in the background. They was rapping on that long ass mic that Don Cornelius probably would have been talking on. Right. They was rapping on a microphone and it was just their bare vocals. Rest in peace, Don Cornelius. But um, um, yeah, that shit is very important for an artist to, you know, just get ready to be on stage before you're on stage so that when you get on stage, you ain't gotta get ready to get on stage. Let's talk about, I don't think I've ever actually asked you about this. You, um, because there's been a lot of dope things you've done in your career that I feel like people don't like emphasize enough. Or maybe I just don't see it enough. Like I, like the Lil C show. Let's talk about that. Lil C's. When you opened up for... Jada? Yeah. No, was it... Lil C's in Atlanta. And Atlanta? Yeah. Oh, And I want to talk about the Wiz Khalifa shit, too. Oh, yeah. Because I don't think I've ever asked you about that. No. No. Uh, Atlanta. We uh we went to Atlanta for All Star Weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, my guy Guap Star Class, Noob, uh, Murph came, my brother came. You know the whole the whole gang came. It was a family affair, and we met up with some folks that came uh, from out here to, that was out here too to Atlanta. And we had a show. We had a few things going on with uh, Smoke Champs, and um, then we uh, had this. What was it, PTA PTA Club? Yeah. PTA Club. Chris Streets, uh, we had some uh, event out there, we extravaganza type of event. It's just okay. like, they had this Western Conference, Eastern Conference type of bud. Like, if the pack was like literally the Western Conference logo on the, that basketball jersey. That's fire. And then like, they had like, just so much pack, like so much grade A in there, like, and everybody was just networking. And then, you know, part of the, uh, the event, Little C's was hosting, it was during the Biggie weekend. Okay. Um, Cause this was in March, so it was around the time Biggie passed away. It was like a couple, maybe like a day or two. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was pretty much celebrating Biggie. They had like a Biggie tribute at for the show, and Jada Kiss and Little C's came through, and uh, yeah, embraced everybody that was there, and had a you know left a very very long lasting impression on Atlanta when we did that. How, talk about like just being in Atlanta, the energy. Like every time I go out there, I get inspired. Like you like going out there. That time when I went out there was that was my first time out there. Like I, I drove by it, like you know, traveling to different states on the like road. But like uh, in March, All Star Weekend, that was the first time I actually been to Atlanta and like really experience what the life or just the culture. And the first first night we was out there was just itself was like mind blowing. You know, the cars, just the you know the women and just the the brotherly love that folks were showing to us when we was like standing in line like we were standing in line and people were having full-blown conversations it's different out there for sure yeah and they wasn't like they wasn't uh they wasn't trying to like dub they wasn't trying to dub niggas at all nothing like that it was like really welcoming 
and you know you can actually smoke in the club so this is the height of covid and nobody cared there was almost like if you went down there to get sick <laughs> Atlanta did not nobody ever gave a COVID. fuck yeah, like everybody was just having a good time that first night Jacquees and Tory Lanez pulled up to that's where a, we came that's Atlanta for you yeah and that was just natural everybody and you know we we was in there early we thought that we had to be there early I'm thinking it was only going to be the people that was standing in line with us mm -hmm. I was wrong by like 11 30 12 o'clock she was packed it was just getting packed it was so packed up we had so much control to be where we wanted to be at. We got pushed all the way back in the cut. Be like that out there. Yeah. Now tell me about the Wiz. Because this was like, what, a year or two ago? 2018. 2018. You posted a picture. I think it was on Facebook. And I never asked about it. What what happened out there? Did you So did you end up like opening for him? Was it a competition? Like, I want to know about that. Uh, I kind of opened up for him because I went, I performed... In the competition and he performed right after but it, oh shit yeah it was like i went last and then he came, he went on right after um so i found a con i found a contest online i was following uh this uh group of individuals called all deaf digital okay yep fuck with I, them yes all deaf digital i was subscribed to them because i was just coming across viral marketing pages on facebook that can help you you know put content out and you can actually get you know some some extraordinary views organically mm -hmm. and yeah I, I just like they would they see they were always legit to me so I, when i just would send stuff to them they would update me and let me know like hey we got your video or we'll let you know if we might feature it um but i stay subscribed to them so i was just one day just thinking about buster rhymes and wiz khalifa there was just one record that i had listened to back in like 2015 called a different cloth and that song was like changed my life and I was like even then I knew I was gonna meet them dudes just based off of that song and it's so crazy how Busta Rhymes was the host of the competition now this was a Doritos competition I found on Facebook just scrolling because I was still subscribed to all deaf digital mm -hmm. it was a sponsored post and I see Terrace Martin oh, I, shit. yeah yep. Terrace Martin uh, he was the guy who, he, he made the he did the production on it and he was you know and he was advising in the commercial that it could be you that goes to Vegas to compete for fifty thousand dollars on the behalf of the do the new Doritos Blaze chips and you know Buster Rhymes the judge. They didn't say who was going to be the opener, but they just gave. I I looked at all the instructions as I got sixty seconds to make a video of me acting like or just displaying that I have a love for Doritos. I always did as a kid. We all did. Yeah. His camera over <laughs> <laughs> but uh we were starting over here we were talking about those doritos blades see shout out to doritos shout out to doritos but uh yeah man i remember just scrolling on facebook came across the sponsored post by our deaf digital about this doritos competition that was going to take place in las vegas and they were looking for five people mm -hmm. to compete for fifty thousand dollars where you, all you had to do was make a video uh, they had provided, you know, the beat which Terrace Martin produced, and um, you just had to rap about the new Doritos Blaze chips and be creative in the video enough to be chosen and approved by Doritos. And I was one of the five people that wow. was chosen. Uh, out of how many do you think? It was like thousands. Just to be picked, chose of that five is incredible. Yeah, man, I had a dope conversation with the dude who chose uh, the five people after the competition and like it was a guy that I would have never thought that would have been doing the, the you know had the approval or making the decision to send uh five people to Las Vegas and he was just he was able to say like he was like yo man when I seen your video you did like this this uh Booker T uh windmill and it was just like dude you know how to do that and rap he was like oh yeah you gotta come to Las Vegas dude and um yeah man uh they gave me they assigned me a manager that you know these two ladies and one of them looked like Kourtney Kardashian oh wow I'll never forget 
and they um they was responsible with like they came to my room and uh, was dropping off mad goodies from Doritos like what? bags frisbees. They flew you out and everything. They flew me out. I was able to bring one person with me. I brought my drummer, which is my brother. Joel. Okay. Yep. And um, when he was chilling. They put up. They put me in the SLS hotel. Wow. For like like maybe like three four nights. They gave me money to spend on a credit card. Shit. They gave me a pouch that got like Doritos blaze on it. You was like a rapper, rapper. Yo. They did it. Like they showed me. They showed me that I not only have the means to do that more often, uh -huh. but man, it is nice. Like the sound check, like the way we did the sound check. I seen what the stage looked like. The stage was shaped in the uh, shape of a Dorito chip, chip. and like the way it was shaped, it was like shaped like a, like the Doritos chip. And the way they, where they're gonna have the audience at was like they're gonna be really pretty much on the side, and you're in the middle, uh -huh. in the middle of the chip, pretty much. And they had. Fucking pyro. They had pyro. The actual fire. How long was your set? I just performed the 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 sixty minutes sixty second song? The sixty second uh portion. Okay. Yeah. It was a learning experience for me because I learned that I too can get ahead of myself. Um I did something in the performance that I learned tremendously so much from. Uh I did something like I did a backflip in the performance. Did you land this backflip? I sure did. Okay. But the problem was I was supposed to do it at the end. Mm -hmm. And I had it coordinated the entire day. Kept telling my brother, I said, yo, bro, we're winning this shit. Like, I don't know about these other motherfuckers, bro. We about to win. I said, it's how we going to win, bro. I'm going to go out. I'm going to do the rap. And they also gave us, like, uh, music to come out to. Mm -hmm. Well, like they chose, we, we, they leave us the opportunity to choose what music to come out to. Um, one uh, brother came out to try to come out to Busta Rhymes. Smart. Put your hands where your eyes can see. And um, uh, this one, there's one female MC, her name's Carly X, she came out to Drake's, it's a really not a stop watch. Non-stop. Non non-stop. She came out to non-stop. This other brother came out to, um, Ape Shit by Beyonce and Jay-Z. Uh, Armani White, you know who that is? Armani White is from Philly. He's a good dude, and he's next up in Philly for sure. I'm going to check him out. Yeah. Um, he came out to Rock the Mic by Freeway and, Phil Freeway and uh, Philly shit. Beanie Siegel, right? I came out to some smooth shit, shit that I know. It was that moment in Roll Bounce when he was like, ooh, I got the perfect song. And it was that moment, because I knew I... They chose names out of a hat. I came out fifth, so I was able to see everybody's performance. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I got the perfect song to come out to since I'm going last. And it was fucking KC and the Sunshine Band. Wow. Hollywood Swing. I could fuck with it. And the way I came out, I seen Busta. Busta was in the middle with this other brother, uh, Jay Todd from All Def Digital. He's now over there uh, at Fuse TV. Um, and I think DJ Charisma. Wow. Yep, DJ Christmas was there. And I seen Busta in the middle, and he was just like amazed. Like, I was like, wow. I tried to block him out, because it was hard not to see him. Fucking Busta Rhymes. Yeah. Right there, yeah. So I come out, it's fire. It was calling, and funny, they didn't even call me Messy Ty. They called me Messy Ty Cooper. That's how they abbreviated me the whole time. That's funny. So it was already like premeditating, yep. like, you know, going Ty Cooper in a sense. But, uh, yeah, I came out so I came out hot. I came out swinging. I did the backflip in the beginning, mm. and it was such an intricate beat where like I needed all my lung power, all my wind. I needed all my wind specifically for that verse because I know the way I wrote it. Buster Rhymes was gonna stand up and have to like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, this is unanimous. Yeah. We're not going back to figure out who won this. We already know who won this. This is it. This is it. Did the backflip first. Man, did, and I did a backflip with fucking shades on. Shades didn't come off? No, they didn't come off. That's interesting. Landed. But after I did it, instead of me catching my breath, I was just hyping the crowd up. Crowd was going crazy. And then when the music stopped, I, I should have just, you know, caught my breath, but I didn't. Wow. I went straight into it, thinking that I was just going to beast on it. And then when I got to, like, the middle part, 
I started feeling like Fine. wind being yeah. taken from me, just slowly but surely. And I was like, okay, I still hold my ground. I still held my ground, but I reflected to myself on my way back up to the green room, which was amazing, beautiful. I said, Ty, you did amazing. I don't care what nobody says. I don't care what you did, win, lose, or draw. If you don't win that fifty thousand dollars, you know why. Yeah. As an artist, you if you why. do not get chosen for that type, you know why. And when I didn't get chosen for that, I was so relieved. Cause then when I had a conversation with Buster, he was like, King, I love you. I see you. He said, I was you. I remember one time I did a fucking competition back in the day, and Chuck D was the judge. Wow. I had to impress someone like Chuck D. He said, so for you, I'm going to tell you, your charisma, your way of getting on stage, and your, you, you, you got it. He pretty much confirmed to me that I don't need to try to make my way out of Providence as a local artist. Like He pretty much told me that I was more than that. Mm -hmm. I was already established. He said, you're so polished. It's like, he said, don't think that this is a loss. He said, take down my number. We're going to enjoy the night because I want you to know you're going to get way more out of this night than you fucking believe, than you can imagine. He said, I wanted to give it to you too, so bad. He said, but you're, he said, but you're breathing. Mm -hmm. And I looked at him, I said, I know. It was, But it was such a dope moment. I mean, yeah, it's an it amazing moment. It was a moment that I can't, like, you know, I can't run on because I wanted, you know, my brother to be there and they was all in the, like, the stands and they could have came back, but they was just being, they were trying to play it cool, like not trying to like be, you know, force. And then, you know, Wiz popped up and part of the itinerary was, um, so before they even decided um, who was going to, when they decided who was going to be the five people, they didn't want to say who the major headliner was because they had Gold Link, they had London on the track and... They had Gold Link, London on the track, um, DJ Charisma, uh, Taylor Bennett, and there was like, there's a major headliner that we're gonna hold back on. Mac Miller passed away. Rest in peace. Yeah. Today's the three year anniversary of that, too. Rest in peace, Mac. Yeah. And you know how close Mac Miller and Wiz Khalifa Pittsburgh. was. That's Pittsburgh to sound. You know, Rostin Records, Germ, and all them cats. But um, they held off, and like when they said it was Wiz Khalifa, that's when I knew it was that like divine timing, just yeah. like that acknowledgement you just made. It was divine timing. I was like, Wiz, Busta, that song, a different claw, life changing record. I'm about to, and it says in the itinerary, you're going to perform, you're going to do this, you're going to do sound check, you're going to, and then you're going to meet Busta Rhymes and Wiz Khalifa. That's fire. Met Wiz Khalifa, had the most dopest moment. I used to watch Day to Days. I still watch the Day to Days. I was a hard, I was a hard body like fan and just like critique of how I want to do Day to Day documentaries as an artist. And Wiz helped me, you know, he helped groom me un to understand to just be the best version of myself. And I watched him. I pretty much watched him grow. I watched him raise his son, and it was dope to have that connection to finally meet him and be like, wow, that's the dude. I pretty much just grew up listening to since 12th grade mm -hmm. and it don't seem like it was that long ago but it was like damn like I really made it here it took it took seven to eight years but it happened and um you know I think his uh when his, his security dudes was telling everybody they had to leave they couldn't um be backstage and he did like a day-to-day a day -to -day where I was like I said something that only Wiz and anybody that knows that day-to-day -day would know and yeah. I yelled it out and it was like I pretty much was like cracking on his, his security guard because the security guard was doing something funny in like one of the day to days. And Wiz was standing right there and he just was like busted out laughing. Like he just busted out laughing, laughing at his security guard. And then we just had that moment. And we just like, you know, I chilled with his DJ Bonix. DJ Bonix, he was staying in the SLS and Wiz jumped right back on a private jet. Just came up, casual 100000 from, casual $150,000 bag from Doritos. My man was my man, my man's was wearing motherfucking pajamas. Fucking whiz. Just different. It was like I was like it felt like Vegas. And after that, I was kind of hurt. But that's when I really got to explore. And it was around the same time, uh, the anniversary of T Tupac's death. Mm -hmm. So, 
I was riding around in Vegas on the strip in a limousine. Just, Kids from Rhode Island. Yeah. Even though I didn't win the fifty thousand dollars, even DJ Bonix and everybody else was like, "Dude, you won way more than fifty thousand dollars." Who won? Armani. Nice. Yeah. Good guy. Good dude. Very talented too. Damn. But that Doritos experience was one for the books because I'll never forget the whole, the luxury of having uh, female managers or like that's how they was acting. But the way they was treating boys was like, oh, like, oh, this is how it is. Yeah. Escorting back to the stage, back like it was just like the way they was moving. It was just like I, I would love to be treated like that. I would love to be embraced, and you know, at the top of the food chain when it comes to the entertainment industry. I believe that it was already written. It's gonna happen. It already Absolutely. happened. So that's so dope that I was able to experience that, whether I won fifty thousand dollars or not, because that just let it me know that that's a sign that this is not the end of the road. I'm glad I asked this question when I did. Yeah. I've always wanted to know like about more about that like yeah. about that situation because it looked cool as fuck. I remember following so it the whole time. Yeah. And I, was, I went back and I was just watching you know it's crazy I was just watching um on my Instagram video the, the video of me dancing in the hotel and the way my caption was he was just like heard you in the count. That's what you said in the yeah. comments. He was like heard you. Because I was just like yeah. No, I, was like, I was like it don't like, matter if you win it. I mean be like, it don't matter if he wins or not. He's in fucking Vegas. Like, yo, this is lit. This yo, is crazy. It was so dope man. I was in. The, I was dancing to uh, living my best life. Doing, yeah. I was getting light and shit in the video. Yeah I was just looking at that video yesterday and I was just like oh shit that really did happen. And every now and then I think about like I'm still here. I'm still on the journey. I may be from Messy Ty to Ty Cooper but I'm still, I, I still feel like the same person. I don't feel like I had to shred who I was in order to become who I am now. I feel like I'm the same person. If not, I'm more groomed, more elevated, more focused, and willing to understand and you know learn, even if it you know hurts or costs me. Too. Let's talk about your latest project, that the Ty Cooper Show, which would be like your debut as as the new artist. Yes, as a new artist name rather. Well, technically, it would be the second. Because I came out with a short EP re relatively before that called Is It Safe Yet? Okay. Yeah. But um, Ty Cooper Show was definitely something I was gearing up to. It was like the debut album, I guess? Yes, in a sense, because like Is It Safe Yet was more like a, it was more like a small snack before you like... Like an introduction? Yeah, like it was definitely an introduction. It was like an appetizer for sure. There we go. That's what it was. It was an appetizer and... I just wanted to get, you know, it was it was just dope too because it was called Is It Safe Yet? It was right in the beginning of the COVID and I was, it played off so many Is It Safe Yet? Is It Safe Yet to go outside? Is It Safe Yet to be Ty Cooper? Is It Safe Yet to, you know, not acknowledge Messy Ty? Or like, Is It Safe Yet to present the Ty Cooper show? Mm -hmm. like it was just playing, it was just like, you know, we, we was going through a lot at that time, you know, trying to perform and doing certain things. But we was blessed to be able to perform still in the midst of the pandemic safely. Um, but yeah, it's the Ty Cooper show. I was definitely in a bag with, uh, you know, presenting or putting out to the world a project where I had like this late night talk show host vibe. You know, I was going to sleep around that time, listening, like watching like Dick Cavett, um, Ed Sullivan. Is that another late night? Ed yeah. Sullivan. Yeah. I was watching Ed Sullivan. Um, these late night talk shows. And the people that they had on the talk shows at the time, I remember I was watching a Hugh Hefner episode of the Dick Cavett and even Jimi Hendrix when he was on there, Janis Joplin. And I was just getting this vibe of like, yo, one day I would love to have a late night talk show. You know, aside of the music, I, I love music so much that it's deeper than just being able to know how to write. Yeah. You know, the passion to, love, to write and all that's always been embedded, but I always love being able to get more beyond the writing, like actually speaking on the music because I believe my opinion and my you know observations are very relatable and compatible and with a lot of other human beings out there that happen to think that certain way in case they was to come across it so I would love to get to a place where I could just be a talk show host like I host my own my own show my own series and I can narrate exactly how I want people to come across this presentation that's looked at as a late night talk show like Conan and Jay Leno, like David Letterman, like those type of guys also inspired me to also, uh, what's the, uh, Dennis Leary, he's mm -hmm. another one. I used to grow up, I grew up watching HBO, so that also helped want to manifest that. 
that talk show, that late night talk show vibe. So the Ty Cooper show is a perfect opportunity to call it that and present it, present it to the world. If you, you look at the cover of the album, it's me, that's Ty Cooper, yep. interviewing Messy Ty. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Yep. And I, and I, so the project drops and... Project drops on Halloween. We went really to big. Vegas. You know, 100,000 streams on Spotify. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, we went to Vegas, shot the video to Drip Chat. Yep. And House, right? House PVD. Shout out to House Shout PVD. out to Austin. They're Shout incredible. out to Hanky Hank. Those are my guys. The guys are really like, really particular about their craft and they don't play no, they don't play that half-assed bullshit. They really are about their quality and, you know, I came to them with the mindset of like, dude, I'm going to have a partnership with Netflix. I want that, I want that quality. Yeah. And luckily, by the grace of God, those brothers were able to provide that quality and that same understanding to want to provide that quality to the audience too. Do you think, um, you know, teaming up a house, name change, just the quality of the videos, like everything, like I, I, yes. do, you, do you feel like when, when all this started dropping, people started taking the brand a lot more seriously? Yes, because I was struggling as Messy Ty to have presentable videos. Mm -hmm. Not, and it was like, I remember I did this one visual before I, before the change that was like a sign of like, okay, we can, we can do this. Like we can actually like present that quality. Yeah. Cause I spent so much time trying to wreck my brain on what to present to the audience. Like, what am I gonna, what am I gonna show on the video? You know, I could freestyle, I could do freestyles on Instagram, but like, if I'm gonna do a video, like, how am I gonna present this to the audience? Like, where not only is the story, cause I love stories, I love storytelling, I love, you know, acts in different parts of the video to bring you to a conclusion. So I want to impl implicate in my, I want to implicate that in my craft. So how can I get the audience to be wild and shit like that? So the visual part as the name change helped because now um, Dan having the understanding financially to provide that kind of quality. Now it's just about being particular about who we work with Yep. and who we work with, you know, just happens to have that. God given talent and just the means of like this is like Netflix shit. Nah, it's you know movie, what I'm saying? It's movie quality. For this sure. is movie quality. This is the kind of quality that I always feel like I deserve to be in front of, to be the face of, and to be the the you know, the means to like get the whole world to be behind the brand. Because there's more to the rapping. It's like we love sharing, we love promoting everybody else's brand. You know, over here in the over here in the Ty Cooper experience like we love that so it's like i don't mind embracing other brands and growing with everyone else that's what it's about and it's not about just one or two videographers if there's other people that have the same like the hunkering for quality and wanting to provide that like it's time to work with them you know it's about getting away from like separating yourself from the amateurs it's okay to you know still be at a certain place in your craft but if you really take what you do serious and you have a budget and you have a plan and the structure behind it, it's about getting with those people that have the same understanding because not only are they within your budget, but they're gonna make sure that they come through on the objective of providing that 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 H that HQ. Absolutely. You know? So what's next musically? Like what what, what are we looking at? The project came out last year, mm -hmm. did really well, hundred thousand on Spotify. Once again, congratulations. Thank you. What are we looking at next? Next is film. We want to get more. I want to get more into film and, and and start showing that that side of me where you know it's really do or die. Now we're gonna really see. We're really gonna like expand with the audience with the quality of the visual, but also with the concepts, the dialogue, and I have a documentary coming out. Okay. Yeah, I have a documentary coming out that is going to be supporting a. Uh, I want to say short EP that's you know themed the theme of the EP is based off the movie Pursuit of Happiness amazing movie right if you recall in the movie Pursuit of Happiness each scene not not every scene but there were scenes located throughout the movie where Will Smith was narrating and using using this repetitive uh, nuance to keep you engaged mm -hmm. and he would like explain it by saying this part of my life is called and then you know what it's called yeah so the name of the album 
It's titled, This Part of My Life is Called. So every record on the project is going to explain, just based off the title, you know, I have a, I have a record on there called Pick Your Poison. And it's a very, like, personal song. It's really, like, a record that I had to really take my time and story tell based off, of true, based off of true story, but to be tasteful enough to still present it where you can still get the point. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the, let's say if you looked at the credits and it said you got the album and you, rec you recollect on the title, Pick Your Poison, you realize, like, this part of my life is called Pick Your Poison. I have another record on there called When the Tables Turn. So it's just different parts of my life that I can easily describe and uh, illustrate it the best way I can. And I've been, I've been going through some like traumatic experiences as of late. So still being in the process of putting the documentary together and the, the, the full body of record itself, it's helping narrate the story a hell of a lot better. So looking, looking forward to putting out an album, another album and a documentary and we're going to start getting more intricate with our music videos, so. Exciting time. Yeah. Exciting time to be, a, to be a Ty Cooper Show fan, for sure. It is, it is. We're going to have more merchandise, just more things that, it's going to be so out of the box that you wouldn't think that uh, we were trying to connect with our audience on and stuff like that, so. Yeah, more music, um, more life, by the grace of God, and also just more content, meaningful content. That's what I'm looking forward to. And traveling more and doing traveling more Traveling more. Yeah, doing more shows. We want I wanna hit you know, I wanna hit Berlin. I wanna see what them I wanna see what them folks is like. I wanna do a show in the O two arena. Let's do a show out there and have everybody in the O two arena going crazy, wearing the merchandise, wearing our jerseys. You know? Nah, hell yeah. That's how I feel. And I see that. You know what I'm saying? I, I had this joke with my with, with Henry from House PVD where I'm like, dude, I had this dream one day where I was like, we was in a green room in like Oslo, and there was like a big ass bucket of ice. There was a big ass bucket that was filled with ice, and it was all these different drinks, but the one drink that stood out was the fucking Jägermeister. I said, yo, we gonna drink Jägermeister in the middle of the day in Oslo. I had a dream about that. It's gonna just, happen. He brings it up every time. He just like bust my balls about it and shit, but like, yeah. More life, more traveling, more music, um, more partnerships, as you can see. Shout out to all the drinks on the table, by the way. Yeah, Drink Marcel. There's some more brands that's not on here, but we have some, some very good people tapped in, and we're just looking forward to expanding the brand and doing everything we can to make sure that everybody's feeling that love, too, because there ain't nothing but love over here at the, and we're here at the Ty Cooper Show. No. I fuck with Bel Air so much, and... Just want to keep showing my love and appreciation to the brands that allow me to support them with only in the intention to support me back as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to thank you for doing this. Yeah, man. I always wanted to be a part of kicking it. I'm glad. Even, you even, even, did it. even the note. Was it the note cast? No cast. I've been wanting to be down on the note cast for quite some time. We finally got it in. Finally did it. And it's like, it's perfect because now I'm at a place in my life as Ty Cooper. Whether you want to call me messy time, as we were talking about, mm -hmm. I feel very comfortable being able to get up and go, get in like come back and like from traveling, go on the stage, about to touch the strand. Yeah, lock show. The locks. We gonna do that. That's a week. That's a weekend after my birthday weekend. That's gonna be a legendary show. Yeah, that's gonna be a legendary show. It we is. You on that. As you can see, I just I had got my Rough Riders tattoo back in, back in April. Oh wow. You know what I'm saying. I was looking at that. I'm like, it looks like the Rough Riders joke, but I can't tell. Yep, I was. Yep, I got that back in April, and you know, I've been listening to a lot of like locks, and ever since that versus, that was a line. That was definitely a divine uh, opportunity. Nah, it's going. Very it's thankful going. of that. Ever since that versus, that was a line. That was definitely a divine uh, opportunity. Nah, it's going. Very it's going thankful be, of that too. Nah, of course, bro. It's gonna be an incredible show, bro. It's gonna yep. be an incredible show. Yeah, man, and I, I don't really bring my mom or like my grandmoms to like events, but they're like thinking about actually coming because I told them how serious, I had to sit them down and tell them how serious it was and where I'm at. Cause they know I, they know how serious I take music, but but they only, I, I like for them to come when it's like a show where like, like last time my mom really popped out was like the Rock Him show or like when I opened up for KRS-One or something like that. 
You just tackling all the legends. Yeah, I was doing that because when Simon Six Seventy Seven was popping, like there was a time like twenty between twenty thirteen and twenty sixteen, twenty seventeen, where there was just mad cats coming through. So my cat, my my catalog of opening up, or excuse me, discography of opening up for rappers was just growing because mm -hmm. there were so many people coming through, and I knew cats like Richard Collier from Keynote Company. Yo, shout out to Kino Company. Yeah, them them dudes they having shows and they was always looking out for it me was and killing shit. For yeah, a very and they was just bringing people through that you wouldn't think. I did. I opened up for Kevin Gates. Early. Early. That's fucking. By crazy. any means, Kevin Gates. Wow. The first by any means. Yeah, nah, Kino Company. I haven't heard that name in a while, but they were fucking killing shit. I remember yep. living in Georgia, like not even being in Rhode Island and seeing all their shows and being like, yo. Who is this kid that's bringing all these shows in? Yeah, this little, this little, this little dude, Richard Collier, man. This little dude, you would even think that looks like he listens to hip hop. He was booking not only the rock, rock and roll, and like alternative rock bands, bringing in a lot of rap but shows. But he was too. bringing in some rap shows. I think he did a Joe Budden show too. I did that show. Did you? I did. Yeah, he did. Yeah, wow. I did that. I opened up for Prodigy and uh, rest in Mob, peace. yeah, rest in peace, Prodigy. I opened up for Mob Deep like three times over there. Shit. Yeah. You definitely put your 10,000 hours in. Yep. Yeah. I always think about that and I feel like there's so much more to do. And it's all about wanting and willing to be wanting to grow. Like, you got to be willing to grow. And, like, that's what, that's what I feel like I'm willing to do at this point. Just what I'm willing to grow. And I said, I don't mind taking the time to learn, even if it costs. But this part of my life is called... When the tables turn, because yep. now the tables have turned, as you can see, 10 years later, I'm exactly who I said I was going to be. Facts. And that's all that matters. So I'm thankful, bro, to be 10 years down the line, still doing what I love. And there are people that I haven't seen ten, like in like 10 years and they still in cahoots and aware and just as much as a supporter then as they are now. And you're one of them, because I remember early. Yeah, bro. You was looking like you was looking like uh, what's his name? Christian Dior, not Christian Dior, fucking uh, Diddy's son, <laughs> King Combs. King Combs. You was looking like King Combs at one point when you had short hair. And uh, this never, one I had the fro. When you had like the you had short like the Cartiers. Yeah. You had like these Cartier glasses. You'll be like this in the photo. Fact. You, I'll be like, yo, this nigga looks like King Combs. That's Why you look like Diddy's son? That's, That's why hilarious. I was like, yo, you're like the Elliot Wilson of Providence. Remember when I was saying that? Yeah, I remember you were saying that. And I fucking love Elliot Wilson too. He's my guy. Follow me on fucking Instagram. Same. Like, yo. And when he did, he, he helped me tap me in with the model newsletter shit. And Elliot. I just show love. And Elliot always taps in. Elliot always watches. And I'm just like, all right, Shout cool. out to Elliot Wilson. Yeah. Because he's a If you're an artist, legend. there's just certain people you should be aware about. Like, you know, the Steve Stouts. You know what I'm saying? The Mike Kaisers. The yo, Elliot Wilsons. You, you name drop some the very, Sean Peckers, some heavy hitters. The, the Vegas Jones from over there at Rock Nation. Shout out to Rock Nation, by the way. Yeah, it's, it's all about building. In the words of Diddy, it's all about love. Facts. That's all we have. So I don't mind showing it as well as giving it, you know. Now, this was dope. I want to thank you for doing this. Thank ne you. Up next is the freestyle. Have a freestyle. Yeah. We got to get in the studio and do a freestyle. I haven't done a freestyle episode in a while, but yeah. you're the next person that's going to be on it for sure. Okay. And I want to thank you for doing this, my thank name. You. Thank you. Thank you. This is a, yet another episode of kick, Kicking It. I know it's been a while, but... Bra me and Bragg are going to get right. Me and JPEG Johnny are going to get right. We're going to get some episodes out. Shout uh, out to the good guys. Shout out to the good people. Shout out to everyone who's going to tune in. How's yeah. it going, guys? I've been kicking it with Cooch. 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 Got a lot of shit to lose. I've been kicking it with Cooch.